So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome from AmSham Abu Dhabi. My name is Liz Bineski, and I'm the Executive Director. It is an astounding pleasure to have you join us today. Today, I would also like to welcome our fellow business groups, AmSham Dubai, the American Chamber of Commerce Bahrain, the American Business Council of Kuwait, and the Oman American Business Center. It's an absolute joy to come together as Americans and interested parties from all the Gulf to take a listen to our most esteemed speakers today. We're joined today by Ambassador Douglas Silliman, who is the president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, a well-known nonprofit think tank founded in 26, 2015, excuse me, that examines all the different angles from an economic, political, and cultural point of view across the GCC. As you may remember, Ambassador Silliman was the ambassador from the United States to Iraq from 2016 to 2019, and also was in service in Kuwait from 2014 to 2016. And we're so honored to have our long-term friend, Ambassador Silliman here. Later on, we'll be joined by Dr. Fatima Al-Shamsi, right here from the United Arab Emirates. She is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for the Administrative Offices at AGSIW. And she, I'm sorry, Administrative Affairs at Paris Sorbonne Abu Dhabi and is the Vice Chair for AGSIW. So I, again, on behalf of my chairman, Jay Houston, and all of the business councils here, we thank you, Ambassador Silliman, for joining us today. Housekeeping note, everyone, please put yourself on mute. And if you have a question, please just put it in the chat box. We'll have some time at the end of the broadcast to answer some questions, if time allows, from our two panelists. We will be recording this event, and we do ask that your attendance here is your implied consent of understanding for that recording. So this is going to be a fireside chat. We've had a few pre-meeting discussions, but what I thought we'd do is first ask Ambassador Silman what his thoughts are about the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington and how they've weathered the pandemic and how do things look from the DC side. Then we'll switch to Dr. Al Shamsi and ask her the same question. And then we'll proceed to dive a little deeper into some subject matters that I'm sure all of you are interested in. So with that being said, welcome Ambassador Silliman and the floor is yours. We'll switch to your screen now, sir. Liz, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to come and speak to not only um, Amcham Abu Dhabi, which I'm very appreciative that you and uh, the group have done this program, but also the rest of the uh, American Chambers of Commerce and uh, business groups for the rest of the Gulf. I want to say a special shout out to my friends at uh, um, ABCK in Kuwait, with whom I worked for several years. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, in answer to your first question, the Gulf States Institute has done surprisingly well during the pandemic. Uh, we were not quite sure how we were going to handle not working in the offices. But as it turns out, we have been able to channel a large amount of our programming into virtual fora like this. And we found that we have increased our audience size. Uh, you know, our, our offices hold as much as 100 people for a live program, but we have had more than 900 people registered for some of our online programs. And uh, that has made it uh, possible for us to reach out to a lot more people than we had planned to reach out to, thought we could reach out to. Another thing that we have done is begun to translate more of our work, which is predominantly in English, into Arabic. So we have expanded our Arabic language audience in the Gulf uh, and in the rest of the Middle East by more than 300% in the past six months. So I, I think that we have weathered the, uh, weathered the pandemic storm relatively well. The question is going to be what will be on the back end of the COVID pandemic both for the Institute, but for the private sector in general and for, for the Gulf itself. Uh, Liz asked me to talk a little bit about the view from Washington, and I want to dive into a couple of topics that are a little bit um, deeper and I think will spark some conversation later in the conversation. Uh, the first thing is just the general atmosphere in Washington. With presidential and congressional elections coming up in less than three months, partisan politics now dominates everything that's going on in Washington, D.C. 
This week, the Democratic Party's nominating convention is happening, and last night, the party formally nominated former Vice President Joe Biden as its candidate for president. Uh, tonight, they are set to nominate Senator from California Kamala Harris as their candidate for vice president. And uh, Vice President Biden will give his acceptance speech on Thursday. This is going to be repeated next week when the Republican nominating convention happens. And presumably, the Republicans will nominate uh, President Trump to uh, run again for re-election. So what I expect to see in Washington over the course of the next three months is a lot of introspection, a lot of looking at domestic American issues, and frankly, not a lot of thought in the quarters of power until after the elections on uh, issues of the world, except where the world invades on uh, American political space. The second issue I wanted to start off with this morning is one thing that has been in the, the news, certainly in the Gulf and in the United States, um, and in Tel Aviv. The uh, announcement this week of an upcoming agreement called the Abraham Accords between the United States, the UAE, and Israel. Um, I'll, I'll make a few personal comments on this. This is, this is my view and the view of no one else. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the timing of this agreement and uh, the White House's hope to have some sort of in-person signing ceremony at the White House uh, between now and the elections is timed to help Donald Trump's reelection campaign. Um, although, frankly, I don't think that an international agreement is likely to sway many voters one way or the other. That said, the agreement itself is a win-win-win. Uh, Donald Trump gets to claim a foreign policy victory and describe himself as a peacemaker uh, in a foreign policy over the past three and a half years that has had relatively few concrete victories. Uh, Israel and Prime Minister Netanyahu gets to move forward uh, and show that states that do not border on Israel, Arab states that don't border on Israel, are willing to deal with Israel openly after many years of dealing with Israel um, quietly. Uh, he will argue that he is getting rewarded. He has gotten uh, the UAE to recognize Israel on its own terms. In the UAE, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed clearly sees this as in the UAE's national interest. There is a lot of complementarity between Israel and the UAE in terms of size, in terms of focus on high technology and investment. Um, I think that the Emirates will see increased economic opportunities and improved relations with the United States in both the Republican and Democratic parties. Um, and in the Democratic Party, because of the UAE's uh, association with some policies in, in the Gulf that Democrats have criticized, particularly the ongoing war in Yemen, uh, the UAE had some real problems on the Democratic side of the House. Now, in talking about the agreement, it's still not entirely clear what has been agreed. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu says that the UAE has agreed to full diplomatic relations. But Mohammed bin Zayed in a uh, tweet last week uh, said that he's agreed to work on a roadmap to full relations. Mohammed bin Zayed said that this ends Israeli annexation of Palestinian territory, but yet Netanyahu says that he is merely suspending the extension of Israeli sovereignty and keeps that issue alive for use potentially in the future. And Israeli sources say that this deal does not in any way approve the sale of advanced US weapons like the F-35 or drones to the UAE, but both Emirati and US sources say that this was an explicit part of the deal. Uh, one thing that I will say about the deal is that it is clear that the UAE is prepared to break with consensus to pursue its own national interests, and that's what it has done in this case. Um, the criticism of the agreement, and probably the criticism that will be most uh, leveled against uh, the Emirates is that this separate agreement undercuts the Arab Peace Initiative, first introduced by Saudi King Abdullah more than 10 years ago, where there was an explicit link between normalization between Arab countries with Israel and concrete progress on Palestinian issues. This, uh, this agreement breaks that link. The, what remains to be seen is uh, how much of that link is actually broken and whether or not 
given what seem to be different perceptions of the different parties to the agreement, uh, progress and negotiations on next steps in this roadmap will proceed quickly or slowly. So Liz, I will throw it back to you. I have a lot more that I can talk about, um, trends in the Gulf, uh, Chinese penetration, and even what a second Trump term or a Biden term might mean for politics in the Gulf. But I'll uh, be guided by your, your questions and uh, what your audience would like to hear. Well, I thank you for that, Ambassador, and that was a great start. You've hit a, you've hit a few of my questions on the, on the head already, but I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Fatima Al-Shamsi to the floor. And uh, Dr. Fatima, uh, are you able to see us or hear us yet? Let's see, I see. Let's see. Dr. Ashamsi, are you able? There you are. Can you hear us okay, doctor? I think she's connecting. Technology, it's a great thing. <laughs> Dr. Fatima. Can you hear us, doctor? Doctor, can you hear us? Uh, you cannot hear us. You're not on mute, uh, maybe headphones. Still can't hear. Okay. Shrub might need to look in the backside and while we're helping Dr. Fatima, uh, Ambassador Silliman, we do have an interesting take on a question if we'd like to have an opportunity to uh, look at this question, I don't know. Uh, the question is, um, do you have a view on Iran's most recent statements regarding what you just discussed, the uh, Abraham Accords? Uh, do you have a point of view or on that? And uh, I'm sure you, you were also aware that the ambassador to Iran was uh, uh, called to His Highness's offices recently. Any uh, statements on that? Well, again, it's, it's a little bit hard to, I, I don't think anybody expects Iran to welcome an agreement between any of uh, its Arab neighbors and Israel, given the focus of Iranian policy uh, against the state of Israel f since its existence. Um, so I, I'm not surprised by uh, Iranian opposition. What the real question is going to be, whether or not the Emirates are going to be able to balance now two very difficult and politically fraught relationships, a, a new relationship with Israel that could be, bring potentially significant benefits to the Emirates uh, politically and economically. Um, but I will note that about a week before this agreement was announced, uh, Abdullah bin Zayed, the foreign minister, had a, uh, a Zoom chat or a Skype chat with uh, uh, Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif, where they talked about COVID and COVID cooperation and potentially other issues as well. So Abu Dhabi is trying to balance a relationship with Iran, uh, not necessarily a friendly, friendly relationship, but try to reduce tensions and make sure that um, they understand what Iranian, Iranian concerns are and prevent Iran from continued mischief in the region at the same time that they're reaching out to Israel and expanding uh, Emirati uh, you know, foreign policy and economic uh, 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 economic goals out, outside of the Gulf region. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a balancing act and it's going to make it, the Iranian angle is going to make it a little bit more difficult uh, for this to be, to go down smoothly in the Gulf and, uh, and with the UAE. As I said, it is clear that something of this magnitude was very carefully considered before it was run into. I'm sure that uh, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed and his senior uh, counselors walked through all the various uh, good and bad things that could come of an agreement with Israel um, and have decided that in the interest of the UAE that they wanted to take this step. So uh, I think it will be a continued balancing act. And the question is going to be with a more conservative um, uh, Iranian majlis in place with Iranian presidential elections coming up in 2021. Uh, will Iranians elect a president uh, like Rouhani who is interested in uh, accommodation and 
retying Iran to the world, or will they end up with someone like Ahmadinejad, who will be much more Iranian nationalist and will more uh, uh, more directly pursue Iranian interests through proxy forces and through steps that will not be, make the UAE happy. So there is some risk here, and the agreement with Israel probably changes the Iranian calculus, but it's a little bit early to say how much that's going to change the Iranian calculus and what they might do, and whether they're their opposition is anything more than rhetorical. So following up on that question, um, there's been some movement and announcements uh, regarding the countries of Oman and Sudan in the past 48 hours. Considering how quickly this welcoming of the state of Israel is now based on the Abraham Accords, I know it's difficult to predict, but in your point of view or what you might be hearing in Washington, do you feel that other GCC nations may decide to follow suit, embrace? Thoughts? Uh, I, I think that there's going to be some pressure for other Arab states, not necessarily only in the GCC, to follow along in the footsteps of, of, uh, of the UAE. Uh, the question is, is kind of twofold. Um, one, which states have already had pre-existing relationships with Israel that they may be more willing to make public? I think Oman is one of those. It's already been a public uh, relationship, but hasn't been formalized uh, in many, many years. Bahrain is another possibility, uh, but it's unclear uh, to what extent uh, Saudi Arabia will, will affect or influence Bahraini policy. I think Sudan is probably a good candidate as well. Uh, among other things, Sudan is trying with its transition to a new civilian-led government to change its, its uh, reputation in the world. Sudan still appears on the US list of state sponsors of terrorism, not because of anything that this transitional government has done, but because of what the previous Sudanese government has done. And I can see, um, again, this is complete speculation on my part, a relatively quick or direct uh, deal between Washington and uh, and Sudan to to have Sudan join an agreement like this, and the United States uh, very quickly remove the state sponsor of terrorism listing from the Sudanese government to permit a lot more assistance um, and to permit uh, a change of the perception of Sudan around the world. So again, I think that there's a possibility that uh, that this could uh, move forward. For the Israelis, it's going to be a little bit more complicated because the basis of the agreement with the UAE was a promise from Prime Minister Netanyahu that he would not extend Israeli sovereignty over Palestinian territories. So the Emirates have gotten something, if you will, for their steps toward formal recognition. Will other countries also require something more from Israel before they sign on to a similar deal? Will Oman be satisfied or will uh, uh, Bahrain or other countries be satisfied simply to reinforce what the Emiratis have done, or will they want pledges to end Israeli settlements or walk back Israeli settlements or commercial uh, concessions or something like that? So in other words, uh, will each new state want to engage in a separate trilateral negotiation with Israel and the United States, or will they simply want to jump on the bandwagon? Um, if I were in these other governments, I would be looking for ways that I could get concessions that would benefit my country as well and not simply follow around, along behind the UAE, which has already gotten its benefits. So, it's, uh, uh, so, so that said, I can see the possibility of other countries signing on, but it may be a more complicated and detailed and time-consuming time process than, uh, than many think. It certainly has been an interesting development, and I think it's perfect that we now have the pleasure. I believe, Dr. Fatima, can you hear us all right, ma'am? Finally, yes. Uh, welcome, my beautiful sister. It is wonderful to see you. Assalamu alaikum. Wonderful to see you, and I'm sorry that um, we didn't have uh, uh, good connectivity, but better late than never. And uh, we were just having a chat with Ambassador Silliman about um, how uh, things are getting uh, developed and, and how pathways forward could happen with the uh, Abraham Accords. But before we dig into this deep thing, we started with a, a quick discussion about um, outlook right now from your point of view, because 
you are here in the UAE, uh, looking through the lens of AGSIW and other things, things are moving quicker than sand on a sand dune in a sandstorm, but uh, perhaps you'd like to uh, look back on the past six months, the first six months of COVID, and uh, kind of give us your take as well on the UAE. We know they've done a spectacular job of keeping uh, uh, their citizens safe. Uh, they've done some tremendous uh, initiatives, all the way up to today where we're talking about uh, the Abraham Accords. So, how about some introductory words, Doctor? Uh, thank you for, for uh, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, meeting. Uh, if if well, I start to, talking about what what UAE has done in terms of the uh, mitigating the the COVID uh, nineteen, uh, I would say that um, uh, UAE did, did a great job. Uh, in terms of uh, implementing the measure to um, uh, to reduce the the, the impact of uh, and um, uh, the impact of COVID and to uh, uh, I mean um, uh, to do that to uh, to to care about the health of its citizen and of course since you are living in the here in uh, uae you have noticed the kind of measures that uh, the, the government um, uh, implement uh, starting from closing school and universities uh, to uh, uh, i mean moving to remote teaching or distance learning and uh, of course uh, uh, suspending the prayers in the workshop places, as well as a switch to remote working and all these measures that implemented in the, in the other uh, side. In addition to that, I mean, the type of, of uh, uh, health care that provided to the people was, was uh, uh, at, 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 at very, uh, I mean, at the top level, uh, as well as the testing. For, for the coronavirus that has been implemented everywhere in the UAE. And uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, the service that provided to people started from either drive through uh, tests that has been uh, done, as well as uh, visiting people at the home or uh, doing uh, uh, Testing for uh, people in the in the in, in the in the area where it was uh, locked down. So so this is the type of 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 things that that has been provided to to the people. Uh, uh, there 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 are other activities that has been has been done in order. Of course, it, uh, the the first priority was looking after the people's health, but also. There are some other things that has been done in order to uh, mitigate the, the effect of the uh, COVID-19 uh, and uh, in, or, in order also to be sure that the economic activities are, are, uh, will not be badly affected. That there, of course, there are negative effects on all the activities in terms of what has happened and, and all the economic sectors uh, the the downward um, uh, the movement and all of the activities and real estate and retails and other activities as well as I mean uh, we are expecting that the, the uh, decrease in the in the growth uh, uh, also they are the effect of I mean the postponement of um, uh, um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, 2020s um, uh, 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 Expo. the Expo 2020, as well as, of course, as, as you know, the, the banding of uh, flight and all this, it has really a, a very severe effect on the economy. Yet the government has, has, has uh, been implementing uh, some, uh, I mean, uh, measures to uh, compensate for for the losses for the some sectors as well as trying to to provide support to uh, other sector in order for them just to uh, to mitigate the the, the negative impact on their uh, economy. 
uh, this is, I think, what what has been done and what is been uh, doing. Yet there are some, we could say, some positive effect that has been uh, come after the, uh, the COVID, which is relating to uh, the, the, uh, the development that has been done in, into the, the, the use of technology at all level, it using, using the technology in teaching, in the health uh, things, as well as using the technology or, or using the advanced technology in, in working area. So I think this is uh, a very, uh, we could say this is a positive effect that has been uh, come and has forced people to, uh, to move toward or uh, using the advanced technology in order to, uh, to do their, their, their business. Uh, I, I think this is what has been, uh, or what, what we have been noticing in terms of how the government uh, deal with the, the pandemic, yet there are a lot of things that has to be done in the future in order to ensure that the economy will, will, will I mean, will uh, flourish again and uh, we, we could be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, prepare if there is another uh, pandemic that might might uh, hit in the future. So I think this is what it should be. Uh, we should look at it in the future, and there should be uh, uh, a, a new plans and a new uh, strategy that we that make us ready to uh, uh, meet uh, to to uh, deal with with uh, with such. Uh, issues. Uh, in addition to the, uh, the, 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 I mean, going to find the solution or find, uh, find the, the, uh, the cure to this, uh, this um, uh, virus is very important also at, at, at this stage. Uh, this virus, it, it, I mean, uh, um, we, we, we are uncertain about the effect of this virus or what what will be the, the future of, of this virus. So we need to be uh, prepared and we need to be uh, ready to, to, to work. I mean, not to stop uh, all, all the activities and we need to uh, accommodate or to do the, 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 I mean, to carry on our, our normal life. Uh, but of course, we need to be careful about what, what would, would uh, the impact or what would happen uh, uh, as, as a result of, I mean, the, the uh, 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 result of, of this uh, pandemic. Uh, I think, I think I will stop here. If uh, any other question, I will. As a superlative introduction, and I, I think everyone would agree, a superlative roundup of, you're right, the extraordinary measures that those of us here in the United Arab Emirates have been so fortunate. If I may, I'd like to ask one question about the Sorbonne specifically. Uh, you mentioned, of course, uh, technology has been embraced. Uh, we saw the opening of VOIP and the usage right now of Zoom and these other things. And uh, you also mentioned that we can't, God forbid, there is another wave. We have learned that we cannot stop. Um, I was just curious on a personal note, and a few other people had mentioned, can you speak briefly about how the Sorbonne plans, and if it has plans yet, what the response would be to a second wave on short and long term. Will classes continue virtually? Will there be some in-person training, uh, excuse me, education? Or do you see a hybrid moving forward? Or is it too soon to predict? I think it is not only the Sorbonne, it's all the university in the UAE has shifted to distance learning. And of course, in order for them to move into distance learning, they have to, first of all, implement the new or advanced technology that will facilitate this facility and make it easy for both the student as well as the, the professors. Uh, there, there should be training in order to have, uh, I mean, uh, the, the university community is, is aware of the development of a new development. And I think, Oh, uh, every university in UAE is is very well equipped with all this advanced technology that is uh, make make them 
uh, easily can accommodate the change and they can accommodate remote, remote teaching. And I would imagine that in the future, remote teaching will be, will be uh, the, 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 the right solution for, for everything. For Sorbonne, I think, especially Sorbonne is depending on the faculty from, from uh, France. So this is, might be uh, a very uh, a, a new way of introducing uh, uh, distance learning so people can, can uh, uh, teach while they are in, in Paris. I think this is, uh, this is I think, uh, uh, a positive effect for uh, all the university and specifically for the Sorbonne as well. Thank you, Dr. Al Shamsi. And Ambassador Silman, I thought you'd like to mention the upcoming AGSIW event being held on August the 20th regarding the education in the Gulf, if you'd like to say a few words for our attendees today. No, I was gonna say, if all of you go to our website, we will be having, um, I guess it is tomorrow, uh, a discussion with uh, academics and university administrators from the Gulf about the future of education immediately uh, as we go into education this fall and the spring and the longer term impact of the coronavirus on how education will be funded and conducted across the GCC. So uh, that uh, I'm afraid I do not have in front of me the time for that program. But if you go to our website, which is www.agsiw.org, you can sign up for that uh, program. It will be conducted tomorrow. Um, I, there are a lot of issues that are embedded within the questions that uh, Dr. Shamsi has just, uh, has just addressed. And we've got a, a panel of experts who will try to unpack that for you and explain the specific issues across the Gulf uh, as people deal with uh, going back to school or conducting classes online. Um, I also want to say uh, more formally, uh, you know, Ahlan to uh, uh, Dr. Fatima, I'm very happy to have her in the conversation and very pleased and proud that she is the, the vice chair of the board of AGSIW. So uh, Dr. Fatima, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, thank you Doug, and I'm sorry for uh, being late to, uh, to get into the the Zoom because I didn't get that connection till uh, Raymond called me and he gave me, sent me the the the, the connections things. You were a flower in a garden of knowledge worth waiting for, Dr. Al Shams. Trust me. Thank you, so, Liz. Thank you very yeah. much. You're my sister in arms. Well, we seem to be getting a lot of questions about the Abram Accords, but before we do a deeper dive into that during q and I thought I'd ask a couple other questions and maybe we'll jump back around. But um, I wanted to get your take, uh, Dr. Al-Shamsi and Ambassador Silliman, on the impact of the recent events in Beirut. Um, certainly Beirut has been uh, in its challenges for a good 40 years now. Uh, and uh, there was starting to be um, a spring of some kind last year, uh, and then this horrible, terrible tragedy, which may turn out to be the ultimate uh, people's rev uh, I hate to use the R word, but rebirth will choose. Do you have any insights on how obviously all the GCC com uh, countries stepped up and supported, and we, of course will continue to support with humanitarian aid and rebuilding efforts, but do you have any points of view about how um, the future of, of the Lebanese people and their reframing of government could um, be a pro or a challenge. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I guess I, I can take that on quickly. Uh, I, I think that su continued support from the countries of the Gulf will be important for Lebanon to rebuild and get its economy as much as it can back on its feet. So I think that there is a real role for the Gulf um, and for the United States and uh, partners of Lebanon for many years, like the French in particular, to help the country rebuild and return to a certain sense of normalcy. The difference this time, I think, is that the, this terrible explosion in the port was not a terrorist attack. It was the result of corruption and mismanagement and political stagnation in Lebanon um, over you know, many years, but frankly, over many decades. And I think that probably um, 
the role of Lebanese Hezbollah, the support of Iran, and the collaboration of the elites of the various uh, sectarian divisions in Lebanon are going to come under much greater scrutiny. You have seen hundreds of thousands of Lebanese, mostly young Lebanese, in the streets asking for a more accountable Lebanese government. And there, this explosion and the fact that it was due to government incompetence is going to fuel, I assume, those kinds of uh, uh, protests in the future. So the question is going to be, what will the foreign influences be in Lebanon? Will people try to recarve up Lebanon into spheres of influence? Will Iran double down to try to protect uh, Hezbollah from, uh, uh, from public scrutiny? Will uh, people who oppose assistance from the Gulf or the United States or France or the, or, uh, the EU uh, push back? So I think that the political developments in the coming months will probably be um, as significant or more significant than the dire need for economic assistance and cooperation. Fantastic. Next question is for uh, Dr. Al Shamsi. Dr. Al Shamsi, the UAE had has and continues to do an extraordinary job at promoting its cultural treasures as it becomes this modern, glittering example of what uh, a future country and, and system can look like. It's working hard to keep its cultural treasures and relevance and applicability and sharing it with the world. But now with COVID-19, when there's not a lot of opportunity for in-person interaction, um, do you have any opinions about maybe with technology, not just on that, but other ways, how, or maybe you have some insights on programs, uh, how the UAE is continuing its cultural journey. And indeed, I felt its cultural explosion as it was getting discovered by all over the world. Uh, I think UAE is, is doing all this. I mean, even with the pandemic and with, with distance uh, working or distance learning, they still have this communication. And I think what's the pandemic that the uh, uh, positive uh, things of the pandemic, we could say that it brings people together. With the UAE is tr trying, I mean, it, during this, uh, we, we could say dilemma or the, the, this issue, major issue, people from, from every sector in the, in, the, in the country, both national and na non-national, they volunteer to work together and to try to find solution. Uh, 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 for the government to implement this, the lockdown and to implement this, this uh, I mean, uh, the, the uh, social distance and these things, it depends on communicating with uh, the, uh, the religious workshop just for people to reach out for their community. And the, the, the fact that the, the community of UAE is, is, is wide and we have different nationality and different language and different culture. So uh, 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 government trying to communicate with, with those people, with those community, they, they didn't discriminate between national and non-national. They provide all the service to everyone they they uh they uh, approach everyone and that's why we could say that the the non national has been very proactive very uh, um supportive they are supporting the go the government and they are i mean um, uh, conveying the the message that the government it needs to be conveyed to their to their people and to their community and this is i think is is positive uh, um, uh, things, and uh, I I I been hearing or I read that, that the the volunteer work that has been done by the non national is marvelous uh, at at all level at the, the, their their clubs at their worship places at uh, everywhere there are a lot of communication and uh, I mean uh, working together. With regard to the the the, uh, the country culture, I think the the all the the institution that is dealing with this are are doing their their uh, business business as usual. 
although they're doing it uh, remotely or they're doing it through Zoom or things, but the activity is 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 working and is, uh, everything is is uh, is I mean uh, uh, doing the, the same thing. I mean. Uh, we, we don't know how long the, this situation is going to be, but I think uh, 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 the UAE with, with it set up and if things, uh, uh, I think it's, it is going to the right direction. UAE providing assistance to everyone. It is not only inside the country, it is even outside the country. It's tried to, to bring people who has been uh, uh, couldn't go back to their home. They they brought him here and they give them the support and they send them back to their their country. So we, I mean, this is the the tolerance and the acceptance and the uh, I mean, uh, uh, communication with each other is the norm in UAE. I think. And we're so fortunate to, uh, to have the UAE because as they remain the most humanitarian nation in the entire globe based on GDP and their population. And we are so grateful for their contributions to the globe. Two other questions before we open it up to the, to the attendees. So if you do have a question, please put it in the chat box so I can count in to the queue. Um, I had a quick question about uh, what is Ambassador and Dr. El Shamsi's take on, we are the GCC, but one of our cousins remains outside the inner circle of trust. Um, has this pandemic opened up an opportunity for progress in this area, or are we still status quo? Hmm. I know we're all talking about the country that starts with a Q. <laughs> yeah, no, no, um, Liz, it, it's a really good question and one we've been thinking a lot about at uh, AGSIW. Um, the reality is that the basis of the GCC was formed to have a unified Arab Gulf position toward the new revolutionary government in Tehran back 40 years ago. And it is clear to me that the Gulf is stronger, particularly in the face of Iranian aggression, if the Gulf stands united. Um, what you have seen, however, over the course of the past several years is, uh, I don't want to say weakening of the GCC, but you've seen a strengthening of moves that are more focused on uh, specific national benefits. Uh, Saudi Arabia has really looked internally and is trying to figure out how to make a generational change and develop its citizens. The United Arab Emirates, in addition to um, you know, agreeing to the Abraham Accords, has uh, broadened its foreign policy reach and its economic reach into the Horn of Africa, into Libya, Yemen to some extent, and is doing investments through ADNOC and others far into Asia to expand its economic reach. The same is true of Kuwait. Um, Bahrain um, and the UAE have moved into fintech and uh, new technology in a big way. So what you've seen is, as the core idea of the GCC remains, uh, a number of the partners have begun to uh, look at what they need to do for themselves in, in addition to what they need to do for the GCC. Um, I am hoping that uh, because, I mean, we in the United States also believe that the GCC is stronger together, uh, and we are hoping that at a minimum the GCC is going to be able to continue with some of the joint economic projects, um, railway, power sharing, the things that have real economic benefits for the economies and the citizens and the expatriates working in, in the Gulf. Um, Concrete benefits from the GCC will show all sides why it is better for the GCC to work together, even when there may be policy disagreements. Um, as regards Qatar, um, I'm concerned by Qatar's increasing cooperation with Turkey in the region and relatively direct competition with other members of the GCC. Um, I am also heart heartened because when I was last in Abu Dhabi, I heard from a number of Emiratis about what do we need to do to bring Qatar back into the fold? How can the Emirates, how can Saudi Arabia, how can Kuwait and Oman and Bahrain um, show Qatar that we are all stronger together? So again, uh, I, I think the coronavirus pause gives everybody a bit of time to think about what the future might be and what is possible. Um, and again, I think that Washington is promoting and uh, 
arguing for greater cooperation. And I think the wisdom of that will eventually prevail. I, I just don't have any idea though of the timing. And again, it takes two to tango. So Qatar also has to agree uh, that they want to come back into the GCC and that the GCC provides them the benefits that they need. Exactly. Anything to add, Dr. Roshamsi? Uh, I, I agree with all what Doug said. This is, this is, uh, this is what is, 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 exists right now. Uh, uh, we, we all uh, believe that uh, GCC, uh, if, if the country of the GCC will come together, this is for the, the benefit of all the states. Uh, yet during the pandemic, I think there were there were some communication, even if they are not direct communication with with uh, uh, people at the top level. But it it, it uh, I heard that there were communication in terms of at least at the the minister level of all all uh, state and the GCC country. Even Qatar was there in order for them to. Uh, I mean, to solve or to find the solution or to, to discuss ideas on how to uh, mitigate this uh, dilemma or how to reach to the, the, the right uh, solution. Uh, uh, yet, of course, as, as uh, Doug said, uh, Qatar is, um, I mean, uh, I mean, we, 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 we is, is not realizing the importance of being a part of the GCC than being close to uh, Turkey or to Iran, which is, uh, I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're not, not support, they're, they're only getting their, the benefit from uh, what they're, they're getting from Qatar, but they are not providing the, the right solution to the, to the country. Interesting. Now, I just want to remain attendees. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. This is my last formal question as the moderator. Very briefly, uh, Dr. El-Shamsi and uh, Ambassador Silliman, as we just said, the pandemic has given people a chance to take a pause and to kind of reflect and look forward. Um, briefly, uh, any thoughts on China and its relation to the Gulf? Dr. Fatima, would you like to start on that, or would you like me to start? Uh, I, I th oh, okay, uh, I will just give some idea. I think uh, China is a uh, great power, we could say, right now. Uh, and it has a very um, close relation with, uh, with uh, most of the GCC country. It is not only the GCC country, it's all the the country in the in the world through the 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 built the the built and road uh, initiative that introduced. So I think uh, um, the relation. I, I mean, if we could say one of the the, uh, the the negative effect on the real estate in UAE is uh, during the pandemic is the 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 drop in the, the number of um, uh, uh, requests that comes from Chinese people in terms of real estate and buildings and this uh, thing. So the drop that have been noticed into the, the, the number of uh, the request on real estate or the demand on real estate, it, it comes because of uh, uh, the demand from the Chinese part is, uh, has been reduced. Uh, yet China, of course, is is a, um, a, a major commercial partner. Uh, there will be a, a lot of project in the in the in the country in UAE and in the other GCC that has been, uh, I mean, between the, the China and and this state. So I think. China is 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 there, and uh, uh, it's it's going to be a, a partner in a, a lot of activities in the area. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with uh, with uh, Dr. Fatima said. Uh, China is a growing power, and the geopolitical and economic balance of power is shifting to the east. It doesn't mean that the United States and Europe are going to not be important in the future, but it does mean that. Asia and particularly China will be more important 
for the Gulf in the future because it will be the largest market share for the oil and gas from the Gulf. Um, in terms of China um, and important issues, for all the countries of the GCC, uh, the United States is still the primary and uh, gold standard defense partner. And I don't expect that to, to change significantly in the future, although there have been some Chinese inroads. The real Chinese inroads have been in the commercial center, uh, sector and through investment. Um, as Dr. Fatima mentioned, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has tried to do development um, and in some cases engage in debt diplomacy with less developed countries. Uh, for the Gulf, you don't need Chinese money as much as much of the rest of the world. So relatively few BRI resources have flowed to the Gulf at this point. And where they have, like in Oman in the Dulcan Port project, they have not been particularly well received and have not been as effective as they have wanted. Where China has really succeeded, however, is on the commercial side. And everybody has heard about uh, Huawei and penetration of 5G networks. It's really the poster child for Chinese uh, commercial penetration of the world, but also the Gulf. But in the Gulf, they're engaged in a number of other sectors uh, for artificial intelligence and robotics. A Chinese company is doing all the robotics and much of the software for Expo 2020 or Expo 2021 now. In FinTech and payment platforms, WeChat Pay and Alipay are increasingly used in the UAE and other parts of the G, uh, GCC. And China is moving fairly quickly to try to launch a state-led digital currency, presumably to supplant some demand for uh, dollars in international markets. In space technology, uh, the company Beidou and their satellite navigation systems have been included in the basic infrastructure of a number of parts of the GCC uh, on digital media. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the eighth largest market in the world for TikTok even as the United States has conniptions over that platform and what the implications are. And Tencent Holdings has entered the Gulf market in video games and esports in a huge way, targeting uh, younger Gulf audiences, especially those that are now home uh, during COVID. And for renewable energy, which is important for the UAE and eventually for other parts of the GCC, China is the largest financier, the largest developer, and the largest operator of renewable energy platforms in the Gulf. So um, what I think is there is a balance to where China has made inroads in the Gulf, and on the political and security side, a bit less so. But commercially, there are real efforts from the Chinese government and Chinese companies to expand its presence in the Gulf. And I think we are beginning to see uh, some progress in that front. Fantastic. Well, I'm very respectful of people's time. So we do have one question, if you don't mind, and I'll throw that to Dr. Al Shamsi before we go to our closing remarks. Uh, Ms. Kathleen Mistry, Dr. Al Shamsi, uh, is very energetic member of AMSHAM Abu Dhabi and also serves on the U.S. Public Affairs Committee. And she's very gregarious and outgoing, currently stuck in D.C., but she would love to know how folks that are living in Abu Dhabi could build even stronger business and cultural relationships with the Emiratis because she feels, and I agree with her now more than ever, we need to build those bridges. Uh, any suggestions off the top of your head? Well, this is a very hard question. I think there, there I mean, I think maybe the pandemic has, has revealed a lot of positive things. What, one of them is people, especially the young generation, are thinking of, uh, uh, especially when they start working from, uh, uh, I mean, remotely, and they're, they're feeling that going, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the, the young generation that I, uh, I always met and I was discussed with. They're moving toward uh, and the, uh, their their uh, uh, SMEs or their their uh, small business. They wanted to start their own business, and they they want to uh, give up working for the government or working for other institution. So I think there are there are always opportunities for uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, business or partnership with other from other countries. I think especially if they're, if they're, if they're American, because I mean, 
people here, they believe in the, um, the American people and the American business. So I think there will be always an opportunity, especially at the, the younger generation who are, are always are uh, looking uh, forward and uh, trying to, to, I mean, very enthusiastic and very uh, hardworking in this regard. Well, thank you, Dr. Al-Shams. I can tell you, uh, I have a lot of Emirati friends because I go up to Wrestle Kaima a lot and I have been learning more and more, but I've got to start learning Arabic. So anyway, I want to uh, give you both a moment to make any closing remarks that you'd like. I'm cognizant of your time and then I'll give my thanks. Who would like to go first? Bob? Okay. Um, <laughs> what I'm going to do right now is lay a lot of concepts on the table of things that AGSIW is looking at in uh, for the future of the next couple of years. And I'll do it very quickly. First of all, uh, the question of a changing security relationship between the U.S. and the Gulf. Both the Obama, the Obama administration and the Trump administration have been reluctant to put more troops in the field. And I think that there needs to be discussion of what a U.S. security relationship with the GCC countries looks like in the future. Um, two, you will see increased geopolitical and economic competition. We talked about the Chinese, but you'll have it also from Turkey, from Russia. And I'll point out that both Saudi Arabia and the Emirates are providing platforms to test both Russian and Chinese versions of COVID, COVID vaccines. Third, you'll see greater state assertiveness. Uh, countries of the GCC working on their own national interests more than you have in the past. Four, you will see an increased number and potentially instability in troubled countries in the region. You've seen it now in Lebanon in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen, in Afghanistan. This is a conversation that the Gulf is going to have to have with the United States and other partners. And finally, um, there's going to have to be some reckoning for COVID at the end. How do countries come out economically strong? How can countries work for sustainability in energy, in food security, in healthcare security, in water security, and be resilient should, as Dr. Fatima mentioned, there be a spike or another round of a, a pandemic at some point in the future. So these are five broad trends that we are watching. And I would say, um, I encourage you all to go to our website, www.agsiw.org. Um, we talk about all of this and uh, we will continue to talk about all this uh, in the coming months and years. Thank you, Dr. Fatima. Uh, well, um, Doug, I think uh, hi highlighted a very important uh, issue. What, what I would uh, say or add is uh, uh, now, I mean, with, uh, with the pandemic, there are uh, always uh, people think that the glory, of, uh, the glory day of a glo globalization has finished. And the people now are, are moving toward nationalization, localization, of industry and of business and of everything. Uh, and uh, uh, more countries uh, now believe the, or appreciate the homegrown industries instead of uh, uh, this. However, in spite of, of the decline in, uh, decline in globalization, uh, uh, the pandemic has proven that many countries cannot withstand uh, the crisis alone. And the only way out of the new form of uh, of mutual is uh, uh, regional cooperation. So I think uh, isolation is is not a reasonable uh, option for anyone at, at all, and uh, especially for uh, if we talk about for post corona world. And uh, I I think. Uh, country will increase, uh, increasingly concerned about the, their uh, dependence on, on, uh, on other, but yet collaboration and uh, communication is, is very important uh, to, to uh, face all this problem that resulted from the, the, this pandemic and to work together in order to build the economy after, after this uh, pandemic issue. What a wonderful way to end. What a wonderful hour I've had to share with you, Dr. Al-Shamsi and Ambassador Silliman. On behalf of our 
GCC chapters in Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Dubai, and of course here in Abu Dhabi. We cannot express our gratitude enough for the marvelous insights you've provided over the past hour. And I urge everyone who is attending here to do try to catch that webinar tomorrow evening. I believe it's at 7 p.m. UAE time about higher education in the Gulf and subscribe to their fantastic newsletter called The Dow. You can get this and so much more. So on behalf of all of us, Dr. Fatima, Ambassador Silliman, and my brother Raymond, who's hi hiding behind the scenes, thank you very, very much for this wonderful event. And we greatly appreciate you. And we look forward to seeing you in person once it is safe to do so. I wish everyone a safe and wonderful evening and a delightful holiday weekend ahead for those of you here in the UAE. Thank you for joining us. That ends our programming. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.